Hello and welcome to The Hearing. I'm John. And I'm Scotto. And without any further ado, on to this week's album, which is from 2016, Monolith of Phobos by the Claypool Lennon Delirium. The Claypool Lennon Delirium is an American psychedelic rock band composed of bassist vocalist Les Claypool and guitarist vocalist Sean Lennon. Claypool, of course, is best known for his work with Primus, and Lennon, of course, is best known for being one of the sons of John Lennon. Um, Monolith of Phobos is the band's debut album. It was released on June 3rd, 2016 on ATO Records, produced by Claypool and Lennon, and features Les Claypool on vocals, bass, upright bass, mellotron, and drums, and Sean Lennon on vocals, guitar, mellotron, drums, auto harp, and cosmic rain drum. <laughs> I think I've picked out where that was. Um, gotta give them credit for playing everything on the album themselves. Um, I had no idea. I, I, I'm not familiar with this album, but I've, you know, I've listened to the other ones more, and I had always thought they just had session players behind them so i think they do on the uh, they do on the se- the latest album they, the other full album uh, they have some session players um i don't know about the eps anyway on to the tracks reminder i don't edit any songs into our episodes for copyright reasons but down in the description if you're watching this on youtube or on our blog at john and scotto if you're listening to the audio version you'll find links to uh monolith of phobos on spotify and youtube so you can follow along if you'd like on to track one, Monolith of Phobos. This opens with just boilerplate psychedelic noise. Um, it's very similar to Astronomy Domini, which they, yeah. they begin the next EP with. It's very similar to a lot of things, as yeah. is most of this album. Um, I was relieved when we get this kind of tonal guitar part that comes in. I did like the Mellotron background vocals. It's this high female voice, female sounding voice. Oh it's yeah. It's got to be a Mellotron because it's the, the notes are very distinct. And that's the only keyboard on the album is a Mellotron. Um, right. Uh, yeah. Kind of, yeah. The, the intro I could have done without, but then when they get to, yeah, first they get to the Mellotron and then of mm-hmm. course, Les starts taking the bass in there. Yeah. And their vocals blend very nicely. I would have liked to have heard more harmonies. Um, the slide solo, and I'm, I, this is not a criticism I'm going to throw at him very much, often. I was actually very impressed with Lennon's guitar playing. But, I was too. I was very surprised at how good of a guitar um, player he is. But the slide solo on this song is very George Harrison. Hmm. <laughs> Sounds a lot like George Harrison. Um, which, I mean, if you're going to play a slide solo and impersonate somebody, Harrison <laughs> is the guy. Um, there, there, you, that is the thing. Like... It, if he so wants to escape the Beatle, you know, mm-hmm. image, yeah. he, he could do that himself, you know, but he doesn't. And, he goes back to it. And I th- I, I need to hear what he's done since um, Give Peace a Chance, that which was 91, by the way. I mentioned this last week. The last thing I remember from him was that remake of Give Peace a Chance. That was 91. So I need to check what he's done in between. He did a lot in, in between that was not apparently Beatlesque. I think um, he was only like 16 or something. Yeah, when they did give us a chance, yeah. It was him um, and Lenny Kravitz. Yeah, he's only a couple years younger than us, which is weird. Like, what I was think Lenny Kravitz's kid. excuse? Um, <laughs> but um, I do like the the groove in verse two that it, it changes a little bit, gets a little more interesting. Um, I like it when they bring that vocal riff, that vocal Mellotron riff to guitar. That sounded great. Um, that leads into a nice short solo. Um the bass solo, the bass solos are always great, especially yes. when <laughs> And it ends nicely suddenly, right after the last verse. They just don't like go out in this big chorus. I, I did appreciate that. And then it goes a little bit downhill for me. On track, on to track two, Cricket and the Genie Movement One, The Delirium. Nice opening bass groove, groove bass riff, great groove. Melody it's is very just very early Pink Floyd. Like it's Lucifer just Sam. very cliche psychedelic. Um, I like the little the fast keyboard riff, but it, that is very Richard Wright. Um, a generic psychedelic is generic. It's uh, and I can say that about so much of this album. It's you know the one of these days bass line, uh, mm-hmm. which Tame and Pala actually did a few years before this uh-huh. uh, i think they were just a bit more melodic than tame and pala uh-huh. yeah um 
I liked the nice frenetic beginning to the instrumental break. Um, but I don't know. Mel- Can you accuse one of like <laughs> derivative of the derivative guy? I think they're they were more influenced by Floyd than Tame and Pala. Oh yeah, yeah, certainly. No, the Les and, and Sean were taking it from the source. I'm, I have no doubt. Um, all of it from the multiple sources. Um, and I think both episodes this week, we, we re- just reviewed Best in Show on Zombie Takeout. I think both for me are a case of expectation management because I expect more from than I got from Christopher Guest and I expect more from Les Claypool because say what you will about Les Claypool. The one thing I don't risk expect from him is derivative. <laughs> I think you could see a lot of his... In his, his stamp on this, there are I, a few uh, songs that do sound like Cat Primus castoffs. Yes, we'll get to those. Those were the, the, that was the high point of the album for me. Was the high, the Primus castoffs, um, but but continuing with Cricket, uh, part one, um, the Mellotron solo again, very generic. Um, I do love how it gets really heavy after that for a little bit though. Um, and but then it just kind of sli- settles into a slightly heavier version of the verse. Um, track three, the cricket and the genie part two, oratorio de cricket. Um, I was of course fully expecting an instrumental because it's an oratorio. Well, no, I, oratorio is, and I I knew this from music theory, but I had to delete it up to be sure. It's vocal and orchestra for a long, large scale piece for vocal and orchestra, usually religious, um, <laughs> basically opera without the costumes and sets. Um, <laughs> But it's just one line repeated uh, yeah. times in the um, background. It is. They almost uh, made do on there yeah. what I was expecting for this. This is where I, I, I flat out say I expect more from Claypool. Um, the cricket sound was way too on the nose. It begins with this long, slow, boring Mellotron solo. Picks up nicely, subtle. I, I do like the groove. It's a bit generic, but it was okay. Yeah, I'm trying to figure out where that end section is from. Like the, it feels like they're quoting someone here, and I can't. It's driving me nuts that I couldn't think about it. I, like I was thinking maybe saucer full of secrets, mm-hmm. but uh, I, I don't know where they. Uh... It, it and it just gets annoyingly repetitive. Um, track four, Mister Wright. Um, this one, funny story. Um, <laughs> completely unrelated, but with the title Mister Wright spelled that way. Um. Back in 94, 95, I was just, this girl I was flirting with, um, last name was Wright. I was chatting with, I'll say. Yeah. Um, I made the mistake, we were talking about relationships, and I said, you know, I'm t- whatever age, 22, 23 I was, and I'm looking for Miss Wright. <laughs> oh, name. no. Oh, no. You laughed it off. Um, okay. Saw the title, it just reminded me of that story. Um, what? And I'm just... What? I have a funny story about this song because I'd actually heard this one before off the album. Mm-hmm. Um, I was at my brother-in-law's house earlier this year and I wanted to listen to, you know, I, I just had their Alexa play me. Uh, they left uh-huh. me alone. So I was uh-huh. like, you know, just play some Claypool and Delirium. And uh, when this song came on and uh, there may have been some kids still in the house somewhere. Uh-huh. And so when it started getting into the themes of the song it was uh-huh. kind of like alexa let's uh, <laughs> let's stop this for now yeah, yeah, yeah um i i get the feeling a lot of the lyrics on this were meant to be shocking <laughs> I, I think uh this is uh very very clay pool <laughs> yeah <laughs> fair, fair point. oh my god i mean I, I don't know i don't know if you say shocking i mean he's <laughs> He tends to get weirder than he does. Like with Primus, his lyrics are just weirder than they are on this album. It's uh, kind of like diet less. I think no, I think like Tales from the Punch Bowl and stuff like that. I think mm. I I could definitely this song would be uh you know at home yeah. there definitely. Um, but the vocal line very Beatles. Um, the beginning sounds like another song, but I can't quite place it. Do like the kind of otherworldly guitar tone. The noisy Mellotron solos are fun. Uh, it, this is probably one of my favorites off the album. Really? I, I don't know. I have a, I, there's a few of them, but yeah, I like. This is, 
this is my pick for weakest. It's just too repetitive and too Beatles for me. It's just the weird blend of Primus and the Beatles, which I guess is what what the point of this is. Yeah, yeah. Well, Primus and the Beatles and Floyd and Strawberry Alarm Clock and anybody who's ever been psychedelic. Um, I think it's good that they got away from Floyd for a bit. Mm. It kind of feels uh, like we've been doing Floyd derivative stuff for three weeks in a row, honestly. <laughs> there was there were some. Last week was kind of Floyd derivative. There was a lot of Floyd last week. <laughs> well, no, a couple of guitar solos that were Floyd. Um, there was the last week was fairly derivative. Um, last week, I mean, they they went different. from. I'd say they were more spread out in Floyd's career. Like they did yeah. stuff. They did stuff from the early days. They did and stuff just, from Division Bell, which and who spread does out. That? Spread out with other other prog too. Yeah. Um, what was the third week though? Before that, we did uh, Elvis Costello's Juliet Letters. I don't which, may see much Floyd there. Which I mean, but you know Floyd better than I do. It was very wall, you know. It okay. was very yeah, fair, fair. You know where they were playing up, and he wasn't even trying to do it. He kind of unwittingly did mm-hmm. like that last song in the wall <laughs> with right, the whole right. album. Uh huh. Right, fair point. Um, <laughs> anyway, on to track five, Boomerang Baby. This is one of the better ones for me. Um, I love the opening rhythm guitar. It's very grunge. The more um, I listen to this one, the more I really like it. And the the um, off-time vocal that stops just short of being two Beatles. Like, it's kind of two Beatles, but then they go in a, they take a little bit of a left turn. Like the um, second heaviest Beatles song ever. Yeah, of course, uh-huh. the first being Helter Skelter. Of course. Um Nice, noisy guitar on the right, the lead guitar. Um, love the super heavy rhythm bass. Um, I think this, this is was the auto harp, right? Possibly, yeah. This is my favorite on the record, to be honest. Um, there's a bass riff that comes in the middle that's very Getty. And, and Getty Lee is less his biggest influence. Of so course. It's, it's nice that he finally showed up. Um, this, there's this great Middle Eastern guitar solo. Um, that's where I really started to respect Sean. As a guitar yeah, player. same here. I, I, I even have the notes. I really didn't know Sean was this good a player. <laughs> um, there's this nice long instrumental break that gets really interesting. Love the interplay between the guitar and the Mellotron. The groove in the last section where they finally say the title. And then it gets a bit Floyd. I would say more Bowie, actually. Okay, okay. You know Bowie a lot better than I do, so I'll, I'll defer. Very, um, you know, space man kind of thing. Yeah, fair, fair. <laughs> um, on to track six, Breath of a Salesman. Nice, clever title. Um, loved this strummed bass in the beginning and this great kind of off kilter groove. Very Primus. I think this is probably the most Primus song on the record. It's, uh, I mean, if it wasn't for his bass playing, uh, I don't think I'd be into it all that much. But um, it's, uh, yeah, I think I put in notes somewhere, you know, I got to keep an eye on this Les Claypool guy. He really mm-hmm. knows how to play a bass. Loved how the two guitar parts are panned far to the sides and kind of competing. Another great solo. Um, that it, Sean is impressing me again. On to track seven, Captain Lariat. I now huge punch bowler desaturating seven. Okay. Here. I, I have uh, and now they're back on their generic psychedelic bullshit um, because it starts with the generic psychedelic noises again. Um, still there. Yeah. Okay. I heard noise. Um, nice jumpy off kilter bass. Uh, some interesting percussion. I think this is where the cosmic rain drum comes in. I know oh, yeah. what a ra- I know what a rain drum is. Um, <laughs> it's a it's a frame drum with some beads in it that gives it kind of a thunder sound. Okay, I've seen those. I've, I've played um, around with that a bit. I I googled cosmic rain drum, couldn't find anything, but I did hear what I think is a rain drum on this. I think they're just throwing cosmic in as it as a you know extra. Little, little psychedelic touch. Who knows what makes it a cosmic? Or maybe rain. maybe they bought one called the Cosmic Rain Drum because for for marketing reasons. I don't know. <laughs> um, I, I love how the bass is kind of a counterpoint to the vocal. Um, I don't know pre- if I would classify this one as very psychedelic, though. I mean, it's just the beginning was the for me. It was just that beginning with um the the, the sounds that was very psychedelic and the core the pre chorus oh, is very. I, think I know what you're talking about, yeah. And the pre chorus goes full on Beatles. Um, I did like the nice chimey guitar after the chorus. Um, again, nice noisy instrumental break. 
love yeah, the bass part. The two of them really do play well together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it, um, the, I don't know if it's on any of their albums. I don't think so. I think I was I checked it and it wasn't. But on YouTube, there's a great live version of Court of the Crimson King. Oh, yeah. They nail it. Um, they kind of split the vocal, too, which was nice because Sean yes. doesn't get enough lead vocals on this. You know, that that is a good point. He, they they split it a lot more on Lime and, Lime and Limpid Green. Uh-huh. Um, but, yeah, their cover of uh, Court of the Crimson King, King is brilliant. It um, is. But the outtake on this song, back to Captain Larry, a big surprise. Um, it's, it ends with Sean playing this acoustic part and just kind of doing an ooze and Oz vocal. And he messes up. He's like, oh, fuck, sorry. And <laughs> she says, go again. And and he goes again. And there's another point where he makes a little mistake and it's, fuck. <laughs> but it, they just didn't edit anything. That's great. It, they just left the outtake, the the, the the messy take on the song, which I loved. <laughs> um, on to track eight, America. Um, no, noisy opening. And I know I've, I've complimented them on the noise before, but this one just got annoying. Um, I hear I say I'm getting tired of the Primus cast offs. Um, I do like the bass part. Um, nice to hear Sean doing a lead vocal for a change. He does sound a lot like his father, but that's just genet- genetics. Genetics, I should say. I, I yeah, I, I, he may even be a better singer than his father. I think he is I mean... a bit better than his father, but <laughs> he's he, it's generic. It's, it's when you, I've said generic four or five times, it's tough to say genetic. Um, it's genetic. He's gonna sound yeah. like his father. It's unavoidable. He's not. I don't think he's trying to sound like his father. Um, no, I don't think he could help but fa- sound like yeah. him. You know. Um, and I think the instrumental work just gets a bit derivative. Um, yeah, this is where they really just go back into the full on psychedelic for a little bit. Um, but it's still very primus. I yeah. mean, it, I mean, it's like, uh, I mean, and I'm a big fan of the, like the late primus too, where like they do the Charlie uh, primus and the chocolate factory. Okay. I desaturating seven. It's just, okay. This is, this is where you have me a little a bit of a disadvantage because all I know of primus is from like Caesar cheese to pork soda. Oh yeah, that's I mean, I, I didn't realize the 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 members of Primus have uh, rotated, like they've left and come back. Okay, the drummer did. I was reading up on that the other day. Uh, Herb like, Alexander, I think his name is. He yeah. left for a while, then came um, back to do like anti pop back. back in like. Yeah, I, I don't know if he was on Green Naugahyde or not. No. Yeah, I'm not familiar with um, anti. I think so Larry Lalonde has, has always been there, or not from the. He wasn't on the original guitarist, but I think he's been there since Virgil Fry. So a lot of this is, I mean, Primus is of course an alt rock band, so it's yeah. it's Claypool with the alt rock, and this of course mm-hmm. is he's Claypool Primus, with the Son of Lemon. Pri- Lemon. Primus as you know a psychedelic band almost. And you know? the thing. And I'm curious because I need I need to hear more of Les's other stuff to see where exactly where his influences lie. Because the Primus stuff they get the Primus ish stuff they get into here, it's not gonna be Primus because Sean and Larry Lalonde are very different players. Yeah, all due respect to Sean, my, way better than I thought. Damn impressive player. Larry Lalonde is unlike anyone else. Yeah, the man is allergic to a key center. <laughs> He's just purely atonal, comes from a metal background. Um, so he brings that real edge to it. And I, again, I only really know the earlier stuff, but Herb Alexander, again, brings a metal influence and a jazz influence and a bit of a hip hop influence. The drummer. I'll have um, to see who's playing on the other ones because. Mm-hmm. I mean, this I, is just them, and it's, it's something kind of neat about that, uh, exciting about them doing yeah. all of the instruments on this. So Primus, it's less, and the other two who bring in their own other influences, and the other two bring a lot of metal. So, you know, less on his own, or with Sean, maybe he is very psychedelic influenced. You know, he does like to get weird. Um Like he's covered um, Pink Floyd with Primus. Yeah, um, have a cigar. Yeah. Um, that's when he really blew my mind because he plays like the keyboard part and the rhythm guitar part and the bass part 
on a base all at the same time. <laughs> I should mention as a an occasional bassist, as a former I don't say former bassist, I still play bass. I'm primarily a percussionist these days. But Claypool is a cartoon character come to life. And not just because of his weird image and his, you know, fascinating voice and all of this. His hands can do things that they shouldn't be able to do. <laughs> He's argue and, and I think every bass player who knows anything about him would agree with me on this. He is the greatest bass player. He's the greatest living bassist, in, at least in rock, in popular yeah. music. Um, in jazz, there's you know people who could blow him off the stage. But in popular music, he's the best there is. Um, Getty Lee has said less is better than him. Wow. And when because less you know said you know he's Getty's his biggest influence. He'll never be that great. But I, I read an interview. They kind of interviewed each other at one point in the nineties. And Getty was like, dude, you're better than me. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, this is Les Claypool. He's he's a legend as a bassist. Um, but I'm curious what his... But I think he's way more psychedelic influenced than you'd ever guess from Primus. Yeah. Um, but on to track nine, Oxycontin Girl. Again, I think the lyrics are supposed to be shocking. Talks about talking about a drug addict who ends up as a prostitute. Um you know, I'm thinking of there's a oh um there's one uh, sublime song that was kind of similar way before this um, but I did like the opening bass solo again. I love bass solos especially when they're less. Um, the chord progression, yeah, the guitar and this is I think a very high compliment to Mr. Lennon. Yeah. A very frip fat sounding solo. Yes, yes, yes. Um, lo- love to the Mellotron background vocals again. The chord progression is very White Rabbit. It just kind of goes up a half step. Um, no, I love the noisy guitar solo. Um, the big riff in the middle is really interesting. Um, kind of it. The lyrics are just kind of intentionally provoking, I think. I don't know um, if uh, if Claypool really goes for provoking. Although, I don't know if it's a Claypool song now that I think about it. Lyrics. This is true. I, I'm, t- I'm talking about Claypool a lot with the lyrics. Could be Sean, too. I don't know who wrote what. Yeah, although I I think this one's a Claypool song because there's Primus songs like this where they yeah. he's just so matter of fact about it. <laughs> and that's a beautiful segue onto track ten, Bubbles Burst. This is definitely a Claypool song. <laughs> I don't know. I think this one's a Lennon song, honestly. Really? Okay. Because think about it, he knew Michael Jackson. Oh, he did. That's true. He, okay, and, you're right. Yeah, yeah. Fact, I didn't even realize it until looking up before the episode. He was in Moonwalker in '88. Okay, so, so he was part of that the whole Neverland thing. Ranch as a kid. He was part of that group with the Corys and Wade Robinson and all of that. I guess probably. I, well, he um, visited Neverland Ranch. You know, which, which answers my question: Who the fuck writes about bubbles in 2016? I fucking love that the ballad of the album. Is about bubbles. <laughs> um, <laughs> oh again, my love, god! Love the opening bass solo. Great kind of edgy bass tone. Very Getty. Um, the melody once again stops just short of being two Beatles. Um, I, I, why write about bubbles? Because it's Sean Lennon and you know, show me on the doll. Um, and I, I think I mean. You kind of get that there's, uh, you know, there's a level of sadness to it too, yeah, yeah, yeah. and just uh, the metaphor, uh, you know, childhood ending, right, right. You know, and of course Michael Jackson, without naming Michael Jackson himself, right, right, of course. Now, what year did um, Michael Jackson die? Now that I think about it, early thousands, I think. I want to yeah. say maybe two thousand five. Um, I like how the song kind of plays with the timing. It's very in and out. It's very. This is very Floyd. If Waters was a better bassist, <laughs> uh, he died. All due respect to Waters. Okay. So All due respect to Waters. Difference. He's a hell of a player, but he's not less. Nobody's All less. Right. So it is very Floyd. The solo is very Gilmore. And, and honestly, you know, I love Pink it, Floyd, but you feel like Waters kind of ran out of bass lines mm-hmm. somewhere in the seventies. <laughs> Waters was a very straightforward pedal the roots kind of bit, play the root note kind of bass player yeah yeah and he's good at it he nails it and and it takes a skill to do that 
I imagine if he ever played with Ringo Starr, they'd be the most staccato and uptight rhythm section but ever. They'd be solid. Together. And and I respect that kind of playing. I will defend Ringo as a drummer to my last breath. He's a hell of a drummer. <laughs> Ringo is one of those guys you can tell, you could hear two seconds and know it's Ringo. Of course, but I don't. I never knew if that was really a good thing or not. <laughs> he can hold a groove like nobody. He's not known for his solos, but he's very inventive and he can hold a groove. Um, and Waters, very inventive player, not very technical. Um, he bought a fretless, so we got Hey You. Um, <laughs> and I've heard the original acoustic version of well, Money, how he wrote it, the bass line's very similar. So he just took the bass line from what he played on the acoustic guitar when he wrote the song. Um, but back to Bubble Burst. I like it. It just needs another section. Hmm. It's just very repetitive. It's just one section over and over again. You know, there's know. no key section. There's no chorus. I mean, yeah, it's just, yeah, childhood Zen Bubbles Burst. And mm-hmm. that's, yeah, they don't actually go for a chorus on it, really. Which is kind of irritating. Um, I needed another section. Beyond that, I liked it. Um, yeah. And and it uh, and now that you mentioned that he was part of that whole group, I get why you write about bubbles in 2016. Okay. And it's funny when I'm first listening to it, and they're talking about this until he gets to the word primate. I'm like, wait a minute. <laughs> okay. See, I watched the video. The first time I heard any of this was watching the video when I posted it on our social media. Yeah, and the video it's very clear. Like there's, yeah. a, it, it's claim. It's not exactly claymation. It's this bizarre, kind of half claymation, half kind of very made up live action. It's a Primus video. Yeah, um, and it's very clearly Michael Jackson and Bubbles. Um, so they don't pull any punches in the video. They make it very clear. Um, on to track eleven. Finally, there's no underwear in space. This is an instrumental. Um, very nice transition. The only really smooth transition on the album. Um, yeah. From the last I do like how it goes directly in the, the, the transition. But I have uh, very, I have very, also very Floyd and reminds me of Great Gig and then reminds me of the beginning of time and then reminds me of Brain Damage. And yeah. that's pretty much the song. Yeah, this doesn't really. It's this Great really Gig me. meets time, the beginning of time meets Brain Damage. It's my um, picture weakest on here. It's just uh-huh. not a spirit piece in the end. It, it, they had a chance to do something really out there and innovative with an instrumental. And I know. It's kind of did on a weak Floyd impression. Yeah. And Although, you know what's kind of neat? I think the way this ends, it's almost like Astronomy Domine again. Okay. Which, if you put this next to the EP, I, I bet the two would flow together. <laughs> Possibly, or yeah. if you or if you put this on repeat and go to the beginning, it would kind of flow. I, that's a good it. possibility. Yeah, I think that's probably likely, and that's something but I would do. The EP begins with Astronomy Domini. Okay. So <laughs> that I am curious to hear. I'm going to have to listen to that. <laughs> um. So, do you recommend it? I would. I would definitely. I think I like the other stuff better, but I think. <laughs> This is, I mean, you got Claypool's bass playing, which is worth the ride, and some weird, you know, Primus stuff on here. It's in here, Primus and the Beatles together. I don't recommend it. Um, All due respect to Les, yeah, his bass playing is amazing, but I'd say go listen to some original psychedelia. Go listen to Strawberry Alarm Clock and Hendrix and Floyd, of course, and all of that, the Beatles. And listen to some Primus, and you'll get something better than this um i have my last note on the instrumental um and i've never said this about an album before i wouldn't even say this about the fugitive which we did not record the review of because we disagree because i fucking hated it and we disagreed too much to have a productive conversation about it i honestly felt like i wasted almost an hour listening to this i didn't hate it it just didn't bring anything to my life that wasn't already there I definitely listen yeah. to this again. Um, I think it's <laughs> like I said, the Claypool's playing, and I, I just like hearing the two of them together. I think I like her later ones, but yeah, definitely listen. Are to the them. later ones less derivative? Hmm. Well, the EPs are of course a cover. And I think oh, I've only listened, covers don't count. And I've only heard the the second one a few times. Okay. But. 
if it's less der- it. if it's less derivative i'll try i'll check it out because you but know I, I don't understand because last week's album was i know i know <laughs> i know i know i was thinking I mean, about this earlier we we've both liked things that are super derivative and complained about things that are super derivative and i don't know why what the difference is because yes i agree that electric castle is super derivative but i love it um ted leo is super derivative but you love him Uh, metric is super fucking derivative but you love them yeah um you shocked me with bandmade because i will admit as much as i love bandmade they are super fucking derivative but you liked it um so, yeah, I don't know why we like th- some things that are derivative and hate other things that are derivative. I, I think I, it's how much of themselves they put on it, you know? Maybe. And I, you definitely hear their stamp on this. Oh, yes, you do. I will say this is, like I said, it's, there's a lot of Primus here. I hear a lot of Primus in these songs. I just, I know Primus, and I, li- and I know um, Psychedelic, and I, I like... I said before, it's a case of, I don't know if I said this in the best in show review or this one. It's a case of expectation management. You know, I went into a Christopher Guest movie expecting to love it. And I was underwhelmed. I went into this, he, you know, cause as soon as I saw I, a couple of years ago that they, these two would work together, I was expecting something incredibly left field, you know, cause I expect less to be weird and left field. And what the hell is he going to do with Sean Lennon? And I, I got derivative how, psychedelia with a little prime star. Oysterhead is isn't that him with um, Stuart Copeland? Oh, if I vaguely know the name, I have to look into that now because I fucking adore Copeland. Well, right. I need to hear that now. I, I need. I will check when we're done recording. I was kind of thinking of that. Let's see. It's um, yeah. It's Trey Anastasio from Fish, Ooh. Stuart Copeland, and Les Claypool. I need to hear Oysterhead then. <laughs> Because I, I've gushed about Les, I gushed about Copeland when we reviewed Outlandus to more, and I've never been a big Fish fan, but Trey Anastasio is an incredible guitar player. Yeah, um, you know they're just their jam band. It's not my thing, but he's an incredible guitar player. Um, anyway, until next time, when we we'll reviewing, we got it from here. Thank you for your service by a tribe called Quest. Uh. Take a big left turn into some hip hop. Uh, until then, of course, always remember, never forget, wherever you go in life, there you, there are. you are. 